defeated Ur-Nama, the mighty warrior king, king of Ur, king of Sumer and Akkad, by the might of Nana, lord of the city, uh, in accordance, whoops, let me just jump ahead. Where is that? Here. Um, in accordance with the true word of Utu, establish equity in the land. He banished malediction, violence, and strife. He set the temple expenses at 90 gurs of barley, 30 sheep, and 30 sila of butter. Again, right, temple rations. He fashioned the bronze silla measure, measuring uh, liquid. Uh, he standardized the one mina weight and standardized the stone weight of a shekel and silver in relation to one mina. In this way, the orphan was not given to the rich man, the widow was not given to the mighty man, and the man of one shekel was not given over to the man of one mina. So in a lot of ways, this establishment, not necessarily of equality, but an establishment of where people fit in the spectrum of society, what they are due, but also what their rights are. Um, just so you know, these, these weights and measures, one mina is approximately 60 shekels during this period, and uh, a shekel is about 11 grams. So when you talk about, as I'm going to read some of these, these law codes in which people have to pay um, a shekel or a mina of silver, um, a mina of silver is actually 660 grams of silver, so it's, it's quite something. Uh, uh, so, um, so in all, we have about 57 laws coming from Urnama and uh, 47 of them survive. Uh, and you know, a lot of times we, we, we read about law codes and how Mesopotamia had the first law codes. Um, often the law codes of Hammurabi are, are sort of brought out as uh, the first set of law codes. This is actually 300 years before the time of Hammurabi. Uh, we have these, these codes. And you're gonna see later when we get to Hammurabi, we will talk about those later law codes. There are a lot of similarities. Also some important differences. But, um, but this is our earliest copy, and it is 300 years before the time of Hammurabi. All the laws are laid out in this sort of circumstantial if-then clause. Um, and uh, we have a number of examples. For one, uh, many examples of capital offenses. And I'll read you some of these. If a man commits murder, then that man must be killed. If a man commits robbery, he will be killed. If the man deflowers the virgin wife of another, they shall kill him. Uh, however, if the wife of that man followed another man and slept with him, then they shall kill her, and that man shall be set free. If a man deflowers the virgin slave of another, uh, then he should pay that man five shekels in silver. Um, all right, so, so already, right, our laws are concerned with, you know, these capital offenses, but right off the bat, we're seeing this very different set of of status, right? Not just in terms of gender, but also in terms of slaves. And slavery was present during this period. Uh, slavery in a sense that uh, maybe is a little different than what we would consider. People could actually be sold into slavery, family members who accrued debts, and debts are a big problem during the Ur III period, um, to get out of debt, uh, either because a judgment was passed against you or because you borrowed at a high rate of interest, and we have a lot of texts that talk about these high rates of interest, you could sell yourself into slavery or sell a family member into slavery and slowly pay off that debt. Um, um, these, uh, well, for example, we actually have some laws dictating uh, the, uh, the treatment of slaves. If a slave escapes the boundaries of the city, really somebody who's not paying their debts, and someone returns him, that own, uh, the owner should pay that person two shekels of silver. If a slave woman, comparing herself to her mistress, speaks insolently to her mistress, her mouth shall be scoured out with one quart of salt. Uh, so pretty, uh, pretty severe. But, um, you know, so these, the, the status that you were kind of, you know, given over to another household, this form of almost indentured servitude uh, does exist during this period. Uh, and these laws regulate uh, those relations. Um, we see laws dealing with marriage and family relations. If a man divorces his first wife, he shall pay her one mina of silver. If that woman was previously married, but is now a widow, and he divorces her, uh, she uh, should be paid one half of a mina. Uh, and if she's a former widow and there's no marriage contract in place, he need not pay anything at all. So, uh, so again, we see this regulation of marriage. It, it, things like uh, if a prospective suitor comes into uh, a man's house and that man ends up giving his daughter to another man, uh, the, uh, the father should pay the rejected suitor two times the uh, amount of his bridal presence. So, um, you know, so we see, see an emphasis on, on, on damages, right? 
uh, in, in the case of uh, the suitor, right, his time is being compensated. Um, and also, you know, harm, physical harm that comes to people. Should you knock someone's eye out, you have to pay half a mina of silver. If you cut off their foot, you pay 10 shekels in silver. Uh, you smash their limb with a club, um, right? Uh, again, in a fight, intentionally, intention has something to do with it, you pay a full mina of silver, whereas if it's an accident, it's less. Uh, severing someone's nose with a copper knife, you pay two-thirds of a mina, and if you knock out their tooth, it's two shekels. So there's this whole kind of hierarchy of damages. People, you know, having almost, I don't know, proto-health insurance in a sense here, right? They're going to be compensated if uh, they're attacked, if these things happen to them. Uh, and we see penalties for bearing false witness, penalties for the destruction of property. If you destroy someone's field, you have to pay for it. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's in a lot of ways, while you know, we would look at this and say, it's, okay, it's tremendously sexist and tremendously um, you know, sort of classist in the sense that slavery exists, there is an emphasis on, um, on establishing and codifying the rights of individuals. Even these slaves can own property and eventually buy their, buy their freedom. Um, we see the mention also of uh, judgment which would have taken place by the king or by a governor, uh, and often before the gods. And the way that this, one of the ways that this would take place is through what's called the ordeal by water. And the ordeal by water, um, we assume, has to do with, um, with uh, submerging an individual in a river. And should they survive, they would be presumed innocent. Should they die, right, the gods, dictated that they should die and therefore they're, they're guilty. Uh, so we see uh, individuals who are accused of sorcery during this period uh, undergoing the ordeal by water, kind of a scary parallel to actually what we see later in Europe during the 13th and 14th centuries. Um, so uh, so uh, these laws are in place. Unfortunately, we don't see any laws against um, usury or the crushing, crushing debt that would cause people to go into slavery. Um, in many cases, we see interest rates of up to 48%. So, you know, you borrow somebody's grain at a certain rate, you're supposed to pay them back. You have to pay them back 48% interest on what you borrowed. Uh, so those of you who you know, have experienced credit card debt uh, at modest rates like 10% to 14% and find you can't pay off your debts, imagine 48%. You're going to be indentured for your life. And uh, in a lot of ways, uh, this is thought to have contributed to the collapse of this system around uh, 2000 BCE. Uh, there are estimates actually that uh, two-fifths of the slaves during this period weren't born into slavery but became slaves during their lifetime. Uh, they were actually sold or sold themselves into slavery. So, uh, so problematic, and we'll, we'll look at the collapse of uh, the Ur III period later uh, in the week. In terms of material culture, though, uh, like Gudea, these Ur III rulers emphasized their building exploits specifically through these religious buildings like temples, um, constructing canals, making the land productive, uh, and uh, creating waterworks. We have a, a stele from Ur Namu, and it was found at Ur, and we don't have very much artwork that comes from this period. Again, we have you know, over 120,000 texts, not too many objects, and the ones that we do have are very fragmentary, but also very important. The, um, we can see that like the stele of Gudea, the stele of Ur Namu returns to these early dynastic conventions that we found at the stele of the vultures, right? Our, we're going back to our regulated uh, registers. And, uh, and again, this focus, instead of like on the, on the, on the um, stele of Naram Sin, which was all about military <laughs> conquest, in this case, it's all about uh, devotion and, connect, and creating a connection with the gods. Um, in this, we actually see Ur Namu pouring libations before a male god, and uh, this upper register here. And uh, this god is probably Nana, again. Not to be confused with Inanna, right? Inanna at Uruk, a female goddess. Nana is a, is a moon god, male, at the city of Ur. And uh, it's actually interesting. You can see here, there's, uh, there are two, two feet that are actually hanging off the edge of the throne. So it appears, while we don't have the full 
stele that, um, that Nana had somebody in his lap. And we don't really know who that is, unfortunately. But it might have been his divine consort, uh, Ningal, who is sitting in his lap. And you can see there's a reconstruction right here, a tentative one that was done by Woolley. In the top register again, uh, we have what we've come to expect over and over and over again, the uh, image of uh, the king uh, and uh, in, this, in this central position making, uh, making libations to, uh, to uh, again, probably Nana. You can see here our best preserved, our best preserved um, register is the second register in which libations are being poured again. Uh, and here we have Nana once more by Urunamu uh, being poured into this, into this um, vessel. And we've seen uh, water imagery, the pouring of libations, these vessels. Uh, these were very important a bit earlier on. You can see here there's another version of it. Right, there's that water being poured out. Right, our, ve our vessel, which is overflowing. Anybody re remember this from last time? Right? <coughs> We've seen this very early on. We saw this as early as the Akkadian period. Here's that seal of uh, Shar Kalishari we saw at the end of the Akkadian period with these vessels that are overflowing with water. And I thought I had the, uh, oh, no, I don't have it. I thought I had the shot of, ah, here we go, right. So remember in Gudea as well, the same iconography, both in his statues, this is one of the standing statues of Gudea, also uh, in his cylinder seals as well, this flowing water motif. Um, again, this flowing water with, with fish, productivity again connected to fertility. We're going to see this again and again and again. Uh, it takes its form in the, it takes it, its origin in the Akkadian period and is again being used conspicuously by these kings of the Ur III period. Um, now let's go back to the second register here. There's a, another thing uh, that we see. Again, a lot of the same iconography we've come to expect. We can tell we're looking at a divinity. He's sitting on a throne. He's raised up on a platform. And he's got those horns, those very clear horns of divinity. But there's the addition of something else uh, that I want to point out to you. And our first example of it, you can see here he's holding uh, what appears to be a rod and a ring with some loops of, of rope coming down below them. Uh, this is another motif, uh, the rod and the ring of kingship that we see during the Ur III period, another motif that we're going to be looking at and seeing over and over and over again. There's been a lot of speculation about this. Um, we've seen as early as uh, Uruk, during the Uruk period, Inanna handing over the May to the kings. Uh, they're given the attributes of kingship. They're given the attributes of civilization. A lot of people have identified this as being emblematic of the May, the rod and the ring. But this is the first time it takes that form as a rod and a ring, which is very interesting. We don't really know precisely what these objects were, but there's a lot of speculation and probably one of the best interpretations is that this is a, a measuring rod and a rope that's coiled up over and over and over itself. And the emphasis here being that just like we saw during the period, if you remember those statues of Gudea, where on his lap he's got the ruler, he's got the plumb bob, these measuring instruments, right? Again, this is the Ur III period, king as builder, king as builder of temples. Uh, this rod and not really a ring, but rope, would be used to literally lay out the land. You could use this to stake out land. Uh, in fact, you know, when we're on an archaeological excavation, we use tools that are very similar to this to, to lay out grids so we know where we're digging. Um,